Father, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. We remind ourselves that you are the creator God, Yahweh, Lord of heaven and earth. Where we're standing in this moment, you've already stood. Father, thank you for worship. Thank you for the sounds of heaven, the sounds of your saints, your people singing together. Father, we welcome you into our midst as we open your word. Sift our hearts, Lord. Reveal your will, your way, your purpose. We praise your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. see a couple things before we get started um, and I also just want to say welcome to everyone here I want to look into the camera and if you're joining us online we want to welcome you to part of our uh, growing family we're glad that you're here with us um, to to just church things uh, after this service we have a salt box connect um, that's lunch so if you don't know about us if you want to become a member you want to become connected you have questions you want to find out about our leadership structure whatever we would love to have you join us in the cafeteria um, right behind the auditorium that'll be directly after this service yeah all right okay second thing um, small group leaders hosts facilitators if after this gathering you will stop by the table right outside there with a the little balloon arch over it we have a gift um, and in that little gift is an invitation to something else so if you are a leader uh, stop by there and grab one of those um, and we will continue our small group journey. The small groups were a real win. I met with four or five of them at the um, Saltbox offices and they were a delight. So anyway, okay. Um, now I want to say, hmm, how should I say this? This is a, at our house we have family meetings. You ever have a family meeting? Okay, this is a little bit of a family meeting. If you're new here, if you've never been here, that's okay. If you're online and you've never tuned in, that's okay. Um, but I'm gonna speak to, to our church here for just a minute. Um, this past week, uh, the Supreme Court overturned the Roe versus Wade decision. Hold on, just a minute. I'm believe with everything in me that that honors God. Hold on. However, I am grieved because I am looking at a capital C church that seems to be at risk of um, elevating things over leading people to Jesus and making disciples. Stop number one, hold on just a minute. I'm going to keep stopping you. I'm sorry. I, I love interaction. I love clapping, but this is a bit of a holy moment. I see a capital C church at this moment that seems to want to accomplish through the laws of the land what only God can accomplish in the human heart. And I think we have to be very careful because a law will never change the human heart. Jesus went to a cross to transform the human heart, to redeem the human heart, to restore the human heart. And by changing the laws of the land, by electing a different president or following a different leader, we will never see the transformation and renovation that God intends in the human heart. I am grieved also because I see a capital C church that is more focused on being pro-birth than pro-life. Homeless people matter, those in poverty matter, those in government housing matter, those in foster care matter, abortion and women, or, uh, women in abortion clinics matter, those in nursing homes matter, those disabled matter, those on food stamps matter. And if we as Christians are going to be pro-birth, let us also be pro-life. That's Jesus.
The last thing that I would say is if you're going to be pro-birth, great. I believe that honors God. I'm there. Now upgrade it and become pro-life. If you're going to get on your social media and yeah, yeah, those are me typing fingers, whatever your social media platform of choice is, the kind of things that I believe would most honor the Lord are things like this, and I'm not currently seeing many of them. In light of the recent Supreme Court decision, we have cleared out our guest room, and we've decided to open it up in case there's a courageous young woman who is going to choose to have a baby. And we've set aside some funds to help her through the process, through the birth. Not only that, to help her get on her feet, to establish a college fund for that baby. You hear what I'm saying? You hear the costliness of what Jesus is calling us to? Praise Jesus for what the Supreme Court did. But let us recognize, church, that there is something so much bigger in the heart of God. We're actually getting ready to turn to John 12. We're going through the Gospel of John. And in John 12, we're going to look at uh, Jesus' response to his fellow men and women, his fellow countrymen and women, who actually want him to change the laws of the land. It's really interesting that all this aligns today. So uh, hear me as I, as I bring this, these comments to a close. Um, I'm grateful for what's transpired. I hope that we as Christians, not only at Saltbox, but the Capital C Church, recognize the cost to be pro-birth and pro-life. Lord Jesus, for this church in this place and for the church, the capital C church all over this nation and around the world, Lord, it is costly to be your disciple. And Father, I pray that we would be a respite for those who are broken and weary and marginalized. Father, I pray that even in a room like this, there's probably a person who's had an abortion or even a man who's been a part of an abortion. Father, I pray that you would minister to hearts, that you would touch us, that you would bring in the mighty name and restorative and transformative power of Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray for us as Christians, both the ones listening in person, the ones online, the ones that listen after the fact, that we would represent you in powerful and mighty ways on our social media platforms. Father, I pray that we could take up our place as salt and light to draw people who are out there to you. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you. Amen. Now. Let's just clap for Jesus. Okay, we can go back to our normal interactive, clappy, talky church, okay? <laughs> Thank you all for bearing with me. Okay, I'm in John 12. Um, I, I love John, I love this book. Uh, we're actually just going through the book of John, and the whole idea is to get us out of the way and really find out what is Jesus saying in, in the book of John. But the book of John is very just amazing to me, because if you start at the very beginning, John starts in the beginning, um, and he crosses some millennia, um, hundreds of years, and then uh, he goes into a timeline in the early chapters where you're crossing decades, and then we're just now entering some chapters where he's going to cross day or months and then days, um, and from this point on in the book, we're actually entering into this span of seg and segment of time where he's, gonna, he's going to um, write about a few days a few hours, and ultimately a few closing moments as King Jesus brings his life to an end on a cross for you and me. So it's really a powerful sort of look and understanding of what the Lord Jesus is doing um, in this moment. So uh, it is very, um, this passage that we're about to read to me is one of the most humbling passages um, in the New Testament. Uh, there was a 
there was, I was born in 1980, the end of 1980, and there was a commercial in the 90s um, by a restaurant called Burger King. And it went, your way, right away, nobody knows, at Burger King now. Your way, right away, at Burger King now. I love a Whopper, just being honest. Okay, your way right away at Burger King now. So I want you to hold that because we're coming down into this passage and we're going to come back to again and again, your way right away. Okay? All right. Now, let me uh, open something else up because I want you to understand something. Um, when Abby and I have time off, we love to jump on a boat and go out to the, our little barrier islands. Yeah? Anybody like to do that? For us, um, it's just it's relaxing for me to get away from everything. Out in the boat, turn the phone off. Yes, it's good. Water, ocean, yes. Um, so we will, there's a place we love to go on the south end of Masonboro Island, and we will, um, it's, it's the Carolina Beach Inlet, and no one goes there because there's a pretty um, severe current that goes back and forth with the tides. So we will pull up, um, we'll drop anchor, and we'll get out, and oftentimes we will walk, and what's fascinating is on a low tide, there's a particular spot in that inlet that is very precarious. So there's about a 50 yard channel at the lowest tide and on each side, it's like a foot deep. I mean, it's like nothing. So there's this really narrow channel and it's, um, it's a beautiful place. And on a rising tide, you actually get to see all this beautiful crystal clear blue water rising and coming in. And it's absolutely, it, it's amazing. We love it. There's these tide pools and whatever. But at low tide, the, the, the current is um, sucking out very, very hard. And we won't even let our kids get their feet in the water in this one particular place because it's dangerous. Follow me? We were there the other day, and we're walking around that south end of Masonboro, and we're just enjoying the day. And no kidding, we were probably just there 30 minutes walking around that bend, and we saw five boats run aground. I'm talking like full speed. You know, you're in your big old fancy boat with your three engines on the back or whatever. Boom! I mean, I mean, like serious, five. I'm there like 30 minutes. I'm like, whoa, it's going to happen. It's going to boom, you know, run aground. And then somebody was coming in, it's go, oh, I'm like, whoa, how does this even happen? Like it's a, it's, a, it's a scary actually inlet. And if you don't know what you're doing, especially at low tide, it's treacherous, yeah? So I want you to understand that. I want you to think about that because as we're navigating the Christian life, we're rolling on in our boats and we're thinking we're doing a great job. And if we're not careful, there's low treacherous water where we can run aground. Okay? And there's something that I think is very powerful here in this passage that we're about to read because it reveals something about the human heart. And I, I, the only thing, if I could go back and sit with John when he was penning this right before he died, that's the Apostle John who wrote this book. But, and, or if I could even ask Jesus, I'll do it when I get to heaven. But I, I would want to know, Lord Jesus, what were you thinking in this passage in John? Because I suspect that his heart is absolutely broken. I suspect that the Lord Jesus is grieving deeply because on one hand, the people are shouting, we Hosanna, we want you, we want you. But on the other hand, it's only going to be like three short days until they yell, who knows, kill him, crucify him. So there's this, there's this treacherous water in the Christian life, and I am convinced that every single one of us as Christians face this, Okay? Let me, let, me, um, let me just self-disclose a minute because I think that might help you. As I've gotten older, I see duplicity in myself. You ever do that? You ever see something and you're like, oh my goodness. How is, is it that that is still there? I really thought by the time I was 41, see, I grew up in a Christian house. I came to Christ when I was like four. And I figured by the time I was 41, I'd have it all together. I thought I would have arrived. I thought I wouldn't be struggling with anything. And now I'm 41 and I'm like, man, I can't believe how far I have to go. Truth. Okay, so what I begin to see um, in myself, and I see it in the body of Christ at large, is kind of what I would call a la carte Christianity. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want this part of you, Jesus, but I don't want that part of you. You, you, you feel me there? Let me give you some examples. Uh, Jesus, you can have my life, but you can't have my thought life. 
Jesus, you can have my life, but you can't have my appetites. Jesus, you can have my life, but not what I watch on TV. Jesus, you can have my life, but not my finances. Jesus, you can have my life, but not my marriage. You can have my life, but not my preference and my partners. You can have my life, but not my savings account. You can have my life, but not what I drink. You can have my life, but not the way I parent. We could go on and on, couldn't we? You can have my life, Jesus, but only if I get it my way. Your way. Right away. We'll, we'll delete out the Burger King now. <laughs> Your way. Right away. Okay, so here's, here's what we're sort of moving into. Um, so I'm in John 12, and Jesus has just had this um, interaction uh, with Mary, who, who has um, washed his feet in nard. We talked about that last week. If you want to listen, you can go back. Um, Passover is happening in Jerusalem. So that means people from all over the entire nation of Israel have gathered around Jerusalem. Best estimates are about 2 million or 2.5 million people are camping out on the hills all around Jerusalem. And there's a huge celebration underway because Passover celebrates the time when they exited slavery in Egypt and began the journey to the promised land. Yeah? Okay, so let's open up here and let's just begin reading. I'm in verse 12. John 12, verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival. Somebody remind me how many are in the great crowd? Probably two million people. I mean, we're talking a lot. They heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So we're, let's go back a couple of days. Jesus just uh, raised a dead guy named Lazarus. That's right. So the crowds are all coming because they want to see Lazarus, number one. They want to see Jesus, number two. So verse 13, they took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna. So palm branches, they literally just went and, you know, took a knife and they cut the palm branches and then they would wave these big palm branches um, for the people uh, or for Jesus as he was coming down this hill. And if you, if you were in Jerusalem um, and you were looking, the Mount of Olives is up here and it comes down really beautifully like this. And you have the Garden of Gethsemane um, where Jesus actually spent a, a, a night in prayer and the, the um, Mount of Olives comes down like this into a valley and then it goes back up just a little bit into the actual Jerusalem proper, which would be right here. And then right outside the old city gates um, was a place where they used to mine a rock called Golgotha. And it looked like a skull, literally. If you see old pictures of it, even in the, in the 1940s, you can see um, why they would have called it Golgotha or the place of the skull. So all this is happening. Um, and Jesus is riding on this little donkey, which we're about to see. Um, and he is, the people are taking palm branches and they've gone out to meet him and they're shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Verse 16, at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had be done, been done to him. Now, before we get back into what all that means, what, what is glorified there? At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified. Part one of glorification. Um, so glorify actually means lift it up, okay? It means to raise. Um, so part one of glorification was actually when Jesus was literally raised. And then he was taken down, put in the ground. Part two of glorification was, again, when he was raised from the dead. So you've got first part glorification, he's literally raised up, being killed. Second part, he's dead, and now he breaks the back of death and hell and sin forever and ever, and he is raised. Okay, so that's what glorification is, and we're going to come back to that several times, so, so keep that in mind. Let's go back to Hosanna. Hosanna. Have you ever sung Hosanna? Everybody say Hosanna. Hosanna. Okay. So Hosanna comes, it's a direct quote. It comes out of Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26, if you want to read it. It's a Hebrew word, um, and it, it translates. And let me also say this, uh, because they're at the Passover, 
um, all of these uh, uh, Israelites that have gathered around, all these Jewish people that have gathered around, they'd be sitting around fires. Um, and while they're sitting around fires in the evening, they would actually be declaring Psalm 118. That's part of the celebration. So they've taken a portion of this Psalm 118 and they're actually going um, to say it. They're saying Hosanna, which means save us now. Now, go back to my Burger King. Okay, the people appear, they're, they're poised for a Messiah to come. They're looking at Jesus. They're looking at the Old Testament. They're hearing him call himself the son of man. They are looking at him in some ways rightly. And they're saying, oh my goodness, this guy's the Messiah. And what they are asking for, what they are chanting for here, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. What they are chanting and saying is we are under the severe tyranny of Roman rule, okay? We are under the severe tyranny of Roman rule and we believe that the Messiah is going to come and he's gonna break the back of Roman rule and he's gonna set us free and he's gonna save us. So what they are declaring as Jesus is coming down this Mount of Olives on this donkey is save us now. Okay, now what Jesus um, is, uh, it's, it's fascinating to me that he decides to ride a what? A donkey. Okay, so let's open this door for just a, a, a minute. Um, in the Old Testament, um, and even in Palestine, beyond the Old Testament, if a king was going to ride in to a city in peace, do you know what he'd ride? A donkey. If he was going to ride into a city um, to declare war, guess what he'd ride? A horse. When Jesus returns at the end of the book in Revelation, what's he return riding? When Jesus rode in Jerusalem the first time, he's riding a donkey because he's saying declaratively, I am going to establish peace between you, broken, lost people, and this Yahweh God. Make sense? So he's inviting us into peace, and there is a time where he's actually going to come back at the end of time on a horse, and he will separate out those who have given him their lives and those who have rejected him. Make sense? Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. So uh, here we have um, Jesus riding in on a donkey. We have people taking off their outer cloak, almost like a carpet, and they're throwing their cloak down on the road. That's in another one of the passages that describes this. They're taking these palm branches and they're waving them. This has happened before, by the way, in Jerusalem. About 100 years prior, there was another incident where this actually happened. They thought the guy was the Messiah. And guess what? He wasn't. Okay. But this time, uh, Jesus is riding in. Everyone is, is celebrating. Um, so let's, let's keep going here. Um, well, let me, let me dig here just a little bit deeper. Jesus, uh, I suspect that Jesus is absolutely heartbroken. Because Jesus is sitting there on the back of that donkey and he can see into the pages of time. And he knows that in short three days time, we could actually, I think it's in John 19, if you want to make a note. I think it's John 19, verse 15 and 16. Uh, Pilate is actually trying to get the people to turn to, to set Jesus free. Okay? And when he gives them the opportunity to set Jesus free, what do they say? Crucify him. So here's what I want you to begin to wrestle with, with me, even like let the Lord sift your heart on, is how is it that the same people who are yelling, Hosanna, save us now, three short days later, now want the guy dead? Like you have to go there and then you have to actually dig a little bit deeper, let the Holy Spirit sift your heart. Because the question is, Lord, is there things, are there things in me that are um, duplicitous, that I want that a la carte Christianity, that I won't, I won't give you my life, my heart, uh, my future, my trajectory. And so we have on this particular day, on this particular morning, this crowd has gathered and they want Jesus the conqueror. They want Jesus to ride in um, on a sort of the war horse 
force, if you will. They want Jesus to set up a kingdom like King David set up a kingdom. They want Jesus to overthrow Rome. They want Jesus to overthrow Herod. They want Jesus to do what they want their way right away. And, uh, it, it, and I imagine that there's a great deal of pain inside Jesus's heart because he knows what's coming. It's fascinating to me because I was actually trying to think, why didn't Jesus preach a sermon at this moment? Like, like all right, let's, let's wrestle that just a second. So he's coming down this hill. There's not all two million people would have been gathered around him, but there would have been, I mean, a ton, right? So he's coming down. People are singing and dancing, yelling Hosanna. And they, there's definitely this exultant, like he's going to come in and overthrow Rome. He's going to set us all free. This is amazing. Um, why wouldn't Jesus preach a sermon? I don't think anybody would have heard him. When Jesus preached previously, we see him on the Sea of Galilee with his back to the Sea of Galilee, the gentle wind blowing, natural stone amphitheaters. But in this case, Jesus could not have been heard. His sermon on this day is the donkey, believe it or not. His sermon on this day is inviting people into peace with Yahweh God. Okay, so let's go back and let's keep reading. And then we'll pause here for a minute. Verse 17. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. What word are they spreading? Word of Jesus, word of hope, word of resurrection, word of life. Absolutely. Jesus, the Messiah. They're talking about it. Verse 18. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Isn't it funny that they go into this sort of, um, I don't know, almost like Eeyore moment? The whole world. The whole world's gone after him. What's interesting, though, is I actually think it's also prophetic. Even though they were exaggerating in this moment, we're now sitting in a spot where I think the Barna, um, I don't know, it was the study of global Christianity actually said in 2019, there's 2.5 billion Christians on earth. So even though these guys are being sort of whiny, mopey, and Eeyore-ish, see the whole world's gone after him, in truth, it was also a prophetic declaration, which just means a foretelling. They were telling what would happen. The whole world would follow this man. Okay, verse 20. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, Philip's one of the disciples, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. So Philip goes and tells Andrew, another of the disciples, Andrew and Philip in turn go and tell Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now go back, what's glorified? Part one is hanging on the cross. Part two is he's actually being raised from the dead. So part one, he's raised on the cross. Part two is he's raised from the dead. Okay, so Jesus is now saying, isn't it fascinating that he's been telling these guys all along what's gonna happen? And yet, they don't get it. They cannot get it. They can't get their heads around it. So he says, very truly, uh, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. What is he saying? Unless a kernel of wheat, so if a kernel of wheat falls, go, go just in the natural world. A kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, what happens? Little soil gets over it, little water gets over it, little rain, little sunlight, what happens? It grows, but that, that kernel dies. It grows into a, yeah, a big wheat stalk. And then what happens on the wheat stalk? You get a harvest of wheat. Okay, so Jesus is saying, I'm gonna die very clearly. But not only is he saying that, he's actually saying um, what I think is, is a, um, it's an invitation to each of us who would walk with Jesus. If you are gonna walk with me, I'm gonna call you to be like the kernel of wheat and fall to the ground in. That's what, you know, when we say, like on our website, you go and, you know, what's our mission? To lead people to become fully surrendered disciples of Christ. What are we saying? We could actually say this right here. 
Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So the kingdom, um, the kingdom paradigm that is perhaps way beyond what we can see and taste and understand is that Jesus knows that by him going to the cross, by him being glorified or lifted up on that cross, by him being buried and then breaking the back of hell and death and sin, what is going to happen is he is going to make a way for all people to enter into the saving grace and saving faith and life of Christ Jesus for all time. So there is this uh, kingdom principle that, that is at play here. Verse 25, those who love their life will lose it, while those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Verse 27, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? That's um, this, this troubled is like he's in deep pain. He's in deep anguish. He's like hurting at this moment. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. What hour? He knows exactly what's coming. No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for the judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Who's the prince of this world? Satan, that's exactly right. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said, them, he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. Okay, I, I want to um, I, I, I want to see if I can crack something open here this morning because I think it's really powerful, and I want to open up um, almost like the psychology of disobedience. Can I do that? Okay, because I think what's really um, powerful here is you have a group of people who are saying, Jesus, we want you, but we want you on our terms. We want you, but we want you our way. We want you, but only if you're going to be the conquering king who comes to overthrow Rome and change the laws and set us free. And if you don't come our way when we want it and how we want it, not only do we not want you, we're going to... Come on, you got to go there a little more strongly. I'm preaching better than you're responding. <laughs> there is a nation who is saying, we have assumptions and expectations about what you're going to do as king. And if you meet those assumptions and expectations, if you do it our way, when we want it, how we want it, then we will follow you. But the moment you come in and go, no, 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 I'm not trying to change Rome. I'm not trying to overthrow Herod. Those guys are going to die anyway. The whole Roman empire is going to pass away. Herod is going to pass away. All this mess is going to pass away. What I am coming to institute is is actually the unseen reality of the kingdom of God. And I am trying to infuse the unseen reality of the kingdom of God into the human heart. The greatest gift, the greatest miracle, the greatest thing is the transformation of the human heart. And Jesus is saying right here, if you want to experience the transformed life, you can come and do like I've done, lay it down, surrender it all, and I will raise you up with me. That's what he's saying. So what he's beginning to invite us into is this same idea where we lay down our life with Jesus. And as we lay down our life with Jesus, he raises us up. You hear me talk about things up here from time to time, but there's, if you go, how do you um, do that on a daily basis? How do I experience the resurrection life of Jesus on a daily basis? One of the ways I do it is I'm going through life and I go, man, I don't like the way I just spoke to my son, Ezra. Do you ever do that? I don't like the way I just spoke to my spouse. Have you ever done that? Okay, Denise is being honest. Thank you, Denise. Okay, so go there just a second. When you recognize something that isn't the resurrection life of Jesus in you and through you, what do you do? I go, man, I was wrong. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me, number one? Usually I'm gonna look at Abby and go, babe, I was wrong, would you forgive me? Number two, when my kids are old enough, I'm going to look at them and go, come on, what am I going to go? I was wrong. 
So what you're doing in that moment is you're not making like the Pharisees and polishing your heart and trying to get everything right and acting like you're perfect. No, no, no. You are actually actualizing the presence and power of Jesus by becoming the kernel of wheat that falls to the ground in. And in the death, which is the same as surrender, in the surrender of your life, the resurrection power of, all, of Jesus all time, heaven and earth, is now made available to actually not only raise you up, but give you a fruit of righteousness and peace and joy. That's the daily transformation of the work of Jesus in and through your life. Are you gonna be perfect tomorrow? Next week? There is this issue or concept or biblical idea of remaining sin that is within us. Michael's given him his life to Jesus, but I'm gonna wrestle with some remaining sin until I cross the finish line. And I can't wait when I cross that finish line into eternity, guess what? I'm free and free and totally free. And between now and then, there's gonna be some wrestle. You follow me? Okay, let's keep going. The psychology of disobedience. Disobedience is a posture of the heart. I would say that these people, as Jesus is coming down this mountain, they are actually in disobedience. They have chosen a political slogan over Jesus' slogan, which is a transformed heart. And they are saying our way right away. At the core, your, the belief says what you've planned for yourself is better than what God's planned for you. We do this all the time, people. I mean, like every single day, something happens and the immediate response is, you get angry, you get upset, you get scared, you get whatever. But, but at the core crux level in your heart, what you are saying is what I would do for myself in this moment or I would do for my family in this moment is better than what you're doing. You follow me? Okay, so uh, your position with God suddenly becomes a position of critique and not of sur uh, surrender. You follow me? So in other words, uh, let's, be, let's just be funny a minute. People come to church and... and um, the idea of church in America is you come in and, you know, you're hanging out and you're like, okay, um, how's the music? How's the preaching? What's the guy wearing? What's the building look like? Right? And, and so we're all like into like this, this, what's the experience like? And so we're critiquing and we're evaluating and we're consuming and it becomes the absolute antithesis of what God has called and created a people to do. And so what's really scary is not just do we critique church, but we actually critique God. And so as things are unfolding in our lives, we then become the judge of God. Father, I am so angry that my little girl Amelia has type one diabetes. And I think that if I was Lord of Michael's life, and if I was Lord of the Mattis family, then I wouldn't have allowed that to happen. And I judge God. You follow me? So Michael Mattis in that moment, in that like analogy is going, Hosanna, yay, Jesus, woo. Until I disagree that my little girl has diabetes. Kill him. You follow me? If you really boil down like my message, what am I actually saying here today? I think it's a question of ownership, okay? In this moment, the people yelling Hosanna, their lives belong to who? Them. As illustrated three days later when they yell, kill them. If you look at ownership, if Michael owns his life, I get to do what? Whatever makes me happy. Whatever feels good. Whatever sounds good. Whatever tastes good. Yeah. If Jesus owns Michael's life, he gets to do with me whatever. You see the difference? So what the people are saying as Jesus is riding this donkey down, and I can only, you know, I can only imagine that as Jesus is riding this donkey, his voice can't be heard, the disciples' voices can't be heard, and I think the disciples are probably really excited because they're like, it's happening. It's finally happening. He's going to overthrow Rome. He's going to ride into the temple and he's going to drive out the Pharisees and he's going to set up his kingdom. And they're probably even going, and my chair is going to be super close to him. And I'm going to be really important in the new kingdom that he's going to set up because I'm a big shot and I know better than everybody else. You hear me? 
So they're even daydreaming. This is totally Michael imagining, but they're daydreaming and going, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. And yet you have King Jesus who is going, I am getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to lay down my life so that this fruit of a kingdom, the unseen kingdom reality can actually come into your life and you can begin to experience the fullness of the joy and the peace and the hope of this unseen reality. But until you are willing to say, I no longer own my life, Jesus does, you can cannot access that kingdom reality. You follow me? That's the doorway to, that is the surrender. When I say surrender your life to Jesus, what am I saying? I'm saying you take the keys out of your car and you go, here they are. My car's not my own. My life's not my own. My decisions aren't my own. No, 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 Lord Jesus, this is you. And so you have this group of people at this moment who are absolutely not only missing what God has for them, they judge him as um, substandard or wrong. They're now casting judgment on Jesus to the point where they're saying, crucify him. And I would actually propose to you in this, if we looked at what is disobedience, that when you own your life, and something happens that you don't like, you are immediately gonna enter into an argument with God. And until that ownership is settled, you're unable to experience the resurrection power of King Jesus. When we think we become, or when we think we own our own lives, we become our own sort of creator. The people of Israel at this moment are owning their country. They want it their way right away. Uh, There's an author I love named Paul David Tripp, and he actually writes about self-swindlers. So you could actually say here that the Israelites have self-swindled. They have convinced themselves that they know better than Yahweh God, who is incarnate, riding on a donkey down. And they have so convinced themselves that they know better than him that they're now going to kill him. And I would invite you into that same level of revelation that we as people, to the degree that we are still owning our own life, owning everything, it's us, it's I own my life is the degree to which you are unable to uh, fully step into the resurrection power of Jesus and is also the degree to which you are going to sit in judgment of God and actually be one of the ones who says, crucify him. That's heavy, isn't it? I need to tell a joke at this moment, but there is none. It's heavy. I told you this is one of the scariest passages of scripture to me. How can a group of people Say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is him who comes in the name of the Lord. And then turn around, not a couple hours later, and say, kill him. As a church, capital C church, I'm not saying our church, but it would be true here because it's true in my own heart. There's times when I come to church and I lift up my hands in worship and I surrender my lives to Jesus and then I go out and I go, well, I'm gonna do whatever I jolly well please. You know what I'm saying? And suddenly I grab the reins of my life back out of the hands of Jesus. I'm gonna do it my way. So the idea of even remaining sin, I mentioned it here, but it means at some level we're always going to struggle with self-rule, uh, self-reign, which even we could probably go so far as to call it self-worship. Oh. Let me open my heart here for just a minute because I think it, it could help you. Um, I spent a number of years um, arguing over God um, about being a pastor this time around. Isn't that funny? And it was like, Lord, I don't want to be a pastor because, well, people will hurt me. I don't want to be a pastor because people come in and say, you're great. And then what do they do? Leave. I don't want to be a pastor because my wife and my kids will have people that they trust and love. And then people, 
leave and we get hurt. I don't want to be a pastor because the church isn't going to grow the way I want it to grow and the people that I want to come are going to, I don't, and I just went on and on and on. And, and if you, um, if you really boil down this life and the things he has called us to, the question is at the end of all our gripes and frustrations, can you go, Lord, I don't fully understand. I may not even fully like it, but I choose to trust you because I know your character. Even though I wish you were riding down the Mount of Olives on a war horse and I wish there was an army behind you and I wish you were going to overthrow Rome and I wish you were going to get rid of Herod and I wish you were going to rule on an earthly kingdom. I'm going to trust that what you are doing in setting up this unseen kingdom reality and inviting us into endless hope and endless joy and endless peace, no matter what our circumstances, no matter what the challenges, no matter what the law of the land does or doesn't do, that you are instituting an unseen kingdom reality in our lives that each of us can access forever and ever. Amen. That that is going to be better than what I want. Now flip that into your own situation, right where you're sitting. Father, I'm suffering with a debilitating disease. I choose, I don't understand. I don't like it. I'm even going to pray that I would be healed, but I'm going to choose to trust you. The place of surrender before him is the place of greatest power. I am convinced, and there's all sorts of people in the body of Christ who chase after the supernatural and the miraculous, and I'm, I believe that happens. You will not find me chasing much after those things because I am convinced that the greatest supernatural act of God is transforming the human heart. The human heart. That is supernatural. Amen. Amen. It's interesting, as we have been reading the one-year Bible, if you're doing that with me, then we're reading it through the Old Testament, and we're looking at all these Old Testament kings. And it's, it's, it's really easy, if you're like me, you read about all these Old Testament kings, and it's like, they made a gold cow. And then everybody bowed down to the gold cow, and you're like, how stupid is that? Like, what does this have anything to do with me? Like, this is, I mean, I remember being a kid. I'm like 16, 17. I'm like, what are people worshiping cows? I mean, how dumb. Like, I'm so much better than that. Come on. You hear me? And then what we set up when I disagree with God and I want it my way right away is I become the object of my own worship. I become the creator in my universe. I become the one who is exalted in my own life. And all of a sudden I find myself bowing down to an idol that is not like go there just a second because we read all this stuff in the Old Testament and we're like, this is crazy. These people are silly, this is dumb, this has nothing to do with me, and yet there is something so powerful, it looks different in our culture, it looks different now than it did then. We're not gonna go cut open an animal and shed blood and and offer a sacrifice to a false idol, but you better be sure that we, as, as much as any people that have ever lived on the face of the earth, bow down to our own idols, and oftentimes it is ourselves. It's the same thing that he's saying here as the people are rolling in saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then three days later, they're saying, crucify him. And I would actually say to you, as we look at King Jesus being raised up to be crucified, died and then raised up from the ground, that what is happening here is the greatest demonstration of divine love. And the greatest demonstration of divine love is a self-sacrificing laying down of everything that you are. So you give up your rights, you give up your preferences, you give up your freedoms, you lay everything down. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about America. Get rid of all that. I am talking about before King Jesus, when you enter into a relationship with him, if you want to love a spouse in the way that Jesus loved you, what do you do? You lay down your preferences, you lay down your rights, you lay down your freedoms. You hear me? It's like... When you begin to understand the costly act of divine love that Jesus is doing, riding in on a silly donkey, uh, like think of that, the king, the creator of the universe, he made the very ground they're standing on. He made the heavens, he put the clouds up there. He made the animal he's riding on. He knows every single person's name. He knows when they were born. He knows when they will die. He knows the hairs on their head or lack thereof. He knows every single thing about them. And as he's riding, 
riding down on this donkey. He is going, they are missing the greater purpose of the kingdom of God. And they are actually so missing it that they are gonna spend their lives fighting against the thing that I have called them to. And they're gonna miss the purpose of heaven. It's like, uh, I imagine Jesus was absolutely heartbroken. Here's my question. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out and we'll do a closing song. But as they come, life is treacherous, like that Masonboro Inlet. Water sucking out into the river. And it's so easy for us as believers to get stuck in a spot where we tell ourselves we're following Jesus, we're surrendering our lives. Yes, we're doing the right thing. I mean, I go to church on Sunday, I give some money. You know, you hear me? I do this. The question is, and here's the question I would, I would uh, urge you to ask and let the Holy Spirit sift your heart. Are there any areas of your heart or life that are off limits to God? Are there any areas of your heart or life that are off limits to God? Are there any areas where you're saying, come on, my way, right away. Stand with me. Lord Jesus, this is a hard message. Father, as we go into this closing song, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would sift our hearts. Father, I pray that this Jesus who rode in on the donkey, who was grieved, I imagine tears streaming down your face as you look at what's happening, as you look at where people are. Lord, I pray that as in this closing song that you would meet with each of us. And Father, I pray we give you full right, Holy Spirit, to convict our hearts if there is anything in us that is saying, you can't have this part of my heart. And then Father, a step beyond that, Lord, if there's anything where we're saying my way right away, would you show us, would you convict us? If our prayer team's here, would you guys come down front and just be available? If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, and you're like, I don't even know what this guy's talking about. Come on down here. I'd love to pray with you. If you're online, put it in the chat. And we'll see if we can get in touch with you. If you're here, Missy did something that I loved last week. She invited people to come down and just worship. If you just want to worship right down here, you don't want to pray with anybody or talk to anybody, that's okay. There's this big gray space right here. You just come down. But let's give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to sift our hearts on where we want it our way and on those areas that we might be holding back from his lordship.
Father, as we go from this place today, we give you rule and reign in our hearts to the best of our knowledge. Lord, we ask that you would gently convict us in those spots that's, that perhaps are not surrendered to you, those spots that we hold back in our hearts and our lives, those spots where we're demanding our way right away. Father, we ask that you would be gracious and gentle with us as you convict us. <laughs> would you lead us out into the full freedom, the fullness of what you have for us in that exchange life. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.